Dzień dobry Państwu, Małgorzata. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Małgorzata Bonikowska, Center for International Studies. We would like to welcome you very cordially to the meeting today devoted to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And this is something which concerns all of us. That is why we strongly encourage you to participate in the event today. The organizer is the European Commission, uh, the delegation in Poland. That is why some technical information at the beginning on the Facebook profile of uh, the delegation of the European Commission in Poland. You can watch us and you can watch us in two language versions, in Polish and in English, because interpretation is provided. The same is also at the uh, profile of the Center of International Studies we will have translation in English as well. So welcome everyone once again. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, the, sub, the, the reason for which we are organizing this event today is the anniversary, it is 20 years of the uh, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. It was signed in December uh, in, of 2000. It was an important year in Nice on behalf of the uh, three most uh, important European institutions. And uh, then it is going to enter into force together with the Constitutional Treaty. It was supposed to get in force together with the Constitutional Treaty, which was not adopted, uh, but the Charter was signed again in 2007 and it entered into force uh, together with the Lisbon Treaty uh, in December 2009. It means 20 years of uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The second reason for which we wanted to organize this meeting is a strategy that was um, announced in December uh, last year. It is a strategy uh, for a more effective application of the Charter in the European Union. And this is what we are going to talk about today. I would like to welcome very cordially our guests, in particular uh, our uh, key guest, uh, who is uh, Commissioner Vera Jourova. Madam Commissioner, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Director uh, Michael O'Flority, uh, who is a director of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, uh, who is speaking to us from Vienna. Being with us. Good morning and thank you very much. I also want to welcome all other speakers. This meeting has been divided into two parts, uh, the two rounds. Uh, after the um, introductory speeches, the first round uh, will be taken by representatives of the institutions, and the second uh, will be for us, uh, the citizens. I would like to encourage you to stay with us until uh, noon. And uh, since it is uh, the delegation um, uh, of the European Commission to Poland is the organizer, I would like to give the uh, floor to Director Jacek Wasik, who is the head of the regional delegation uh, of uh, the Commission in Wrocław. Director, over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers. I would like to thank you very much for accepting the invitation to participate in the webinar today, which is organized, as it was mentioned before, together by uh, the delegation of uh, the uh, European Commission to Poland and uh, the uh, Agency for Fundamental Rights. I would like to thank Director Małgorzata Bonikowska, who is the president of the Center for International Studies, uh, for being a moderator uh, of this um, event. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the cycle of meetings about the um, Charter of Fundamental Rights and the importance uh, for the European Union was uh, started under the initiative uh, of the Agency for Fundamental Rights and the European Commission in Poznan last year. I am really very happy that uh, today we can continue the debate uh, that is devoted to this document with the participation of excellent speakers and uh, participants of our today's meeting. The preamble uh, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, very clearly says that the European Union is based uh, on an um, undividable universal uh, values of the dignity of a person, freedom, equality and solidarity. That it is based uh, on the principles of democracy and the state ruled by the law. That is why the Charter must uh, be a, a, a safeguard of the freedoms and rights it describes, uh, for it to be a real buffer that protects uh, the European citizens uh, from the lawlessness. The European Commission in December last year presented a new strategy with the objective of a more effective application uh, of the Charter by Member States, but also the strengthening of the position of uh, the organizations of civil society 
uh, the uh, uh, rights defenders uh, uh, as uh, well as um, uh, lawyers. And this charter is going to be the uh, road sign for the European institutions in the activities taken by them. And it's also to raise human uh, social awareness as to its essence and uh, meaning. The discussion about the role of the Charter of Fundamental Rights is happening in Poland in the very good moment, but the context is much broader, which can be testified to by the events uh, in Belarus last Sunday, and we will definitely not avoid this subject. Moreover, we should raise this subject. Not a long time ago, representatives of the world of politics did not question or challenge such notions as the state ruled by the law. Uh, well, there was there were no attempts to undermine the rights of all the citizens uh, to uh, personal dignity uh, uh, connected with their gender, uh, their ideology or sexual orientation. However, in the world uh, in which a strong position was taken by populist movements and were uh, the consequences of the contempt for the minority uh, are, are uh, really forgotten. It is necessary to stress very strongly the role of the European Union, which was established to uh, actually uh, reject uh, the uh, European fatality, which uh, condemned the continent uh, to the bloodshed and the tragedy of uh, the war. And here I would like to quote Dalai Lama, peace can prevail only where uh, human rights are respected where people have uh, uh, food provided and where individuals and nations are free. The Charter of Fundamental Rights together with democratic treaties uh, and the constitutions of member states uh, is to safeguard citizens uh, from uh, the injustice of discrimination or lawlessness uh, uh, or which is known from the authoritarian systems. 20 years after the signing of the Charter, it's worthwhile trying to answer a question uh, whether and to what extent uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union uh, is fulfilling the hopes we attached to it and what to do to make sure that the guarantees of uh, the freedom, democracy, as well as respect for the human rights and dignities were really undeniable. I would like to wish you a very interesting debate and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the introduction. I think that the best uh, 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 idea now is to present to you to a short video. What if policies make indivisible rights visible to all EU citizens? What if legislation makes rules more relevant to our common values? What if this makes people the priority of our law and policy making? All by using the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Since 2009, the Charter has served as an essential tool in turning EU citizens' rights into reality. As a result, we've advanced our laws and policies as the EU has adopted many initiatives to protect and promote people's rights. But now is the time to take them even further. With over 50 articles, the Charter is a legally binding, modern, human rights catalogue that enriches existing entitlements. Its profound phrasing goes beyond many constitutional texts. It can inspire law and policymakers to develop more sustainable and better legislation. And where states, regions or municipalities are acting on matters where the EU has a say, the Charter turns from a soft aspiration into hard laws to the benefits of all of us. The Charter helps you to make indivisible rights visible, rules more relevant, people the priority. Apply the Charter, deliver our rights. Thank you very much. I hope. Uh, well, I think that without uh, further delays, uh, I would like to give the floor to the uh, Vice President of the European Commission responsible for values and transparency, Commissioner Vera Jourova. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
I am really delighted uh, to be with you for this anniversary event uh, of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. I'd like, first of all, to thank my colleagues from the permanent representation in Poland and from the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights for organizing the event. Yes, Jacek, you quoted uh, Dalai Lama, and I have Asa Havel behind me. These two were friends. <laughs> they really were on the same page, where I think we all should try to be and remain, uh, even though to defend the human rights is more and more difficult and risky job. So let's, uh, let's remain on the same pace. And uh, I think this is also one of the reasons why we are discussing the uh, implementation of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in the real life, because it is not the paper, it is something which, which has to be the living document which helps the people. And I'm convinced that over the past decade, the Charter has helped better promote and protect people's fundamental rights in the EU. It has triggered new European legislation upholding and serving these rights and these new rules on, for instance, data protection, gender equality, the protection of whistleblowers, as well as protection of victims of crime are key examples. Uh, and now we know that we live in a very turbulent time, not only because COVID, uh, but uh, we go through very, uh, very large and difficult uh, for many uh, transformation through the technologies. And uh, the time is, uh, and this is the time of uncertainty also for this technological transition, which is not easy for, for, to adapt for many. I was asked recently several times in different fora how we shall guarantee uh, the, all the rights for those who are not fully digitalized. And I think this is also the task of today. So I am mentioning it that also the charter is the bedrock or the basis for the legislation which we are adopting at the European level, uh, which covers the digital sector and digital era, be it the Digital Services Act, which we adopted in, in December as, as the commission now it is in the legislative process, or the legislation relating to artificial intelligence. Uh, we uh, decided to come with legally, legally binding rules. Uh, and in everything we do in the legislation which relates to digital transition and AI technologies uh, and other emerging technologies, we always say that we have to keep European approach. It, it, it is very helpful to have this strong pillar that we want to promote technologies which will uh, serve the people, not vice versa. We want to promote technologies which will not uh, uh, cement and, and uh, even strengthen the, the discrimination which we see in real life. The discrimination must not be copy-paste, uh, uh, transferred to AI in your reality. So this human approach and, and yes, uh, human uh, centric approach, it is, it is the leading principle. And th this principle is based on the, on the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And this is what I love on Europe. Now we see that, uh, that European Union is uh, in the forefront of, of uh, coming with the rules, which want to make the digital world and internet uh, a good place uh, and good solution for the people in Europe. It's not dictated by big money as we see in the United States, or it is not dictated by the effort and appetite of omnipotent totalitarian regime to abuse these technologies against the people. So this is European approach. And why are we so strong uh, on, on this and, and on certainty that we are doing the right thing? Well, because we have the charter, because this is the, this is the pillar we, we have at our disposal. Uh, every time we speak about the, the human rights, about the situation of minorities, uh, about the situation of different parts of our society, uh, I, I repeated it many times, we need uh, high quality data. That's the role of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, which provides us with data and in, in, in information on the fundamental rights situation on the ground. 
the number of independent national human rights institutions and bodies has also risen, uh, risen significantly, laying down solid foundations for the enforcement of individual rights in practice. So these are all good news. Uh, we have legislation, we have bodies which uh, are enforcing uh, the, the rules. We have the, the agency which uh, is providing us with, with all the necessary data and, and very high quality analytical work. But still, what is bad news? A charter rights are far from being a reality for all as underlined in the Commission's recent action plan against racism every day in Europe, people are victims of discrimination, hatred and violence. And the pandemic widened further the equality gap and put fundamental rights to the real test. We all have to play our role to amend this and to ensure that the Charter is used to its full potential. Our consultations for the strategy on the charter implementation. So, so in these consultations, one of the legal practitioners told us that the charter was for him like one of these brown envelopes you get from the tax authorities. You know, it is important, but you do not dare to open it. And this is what we want. This is what we need to change. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is a relatively new instrument which is still underused. The charter is not more complex than any other legal instruments, but it requires a lot of training and awareness raising. It should be in the core curriculum of any law school. It needs to be a part of our everyday life. Too few of our citizens know about their rights. My aim is that in 10 years from now, we will see clear progress in the use of the Charter for direct improvement of people's lives. This is why with the new strategy for the Charter implementation adopted last December, I made it a priority to make the Charter effective in people's lives. Uh, I would like first to talk about the judges in this context. The strategy puts the focus on the key role played by judges, civil society organizations, and national human rights institutions. They are the ones that make the charter a reality for the people. To do their job effectively, they need to be able to work independently in a safe and supporting environment and they need to be given the tools to use the Charter to its full potential. The application of EU law relies not only on the Court of Justice of the EU, but also on national courts in the Member States. National judges are European judges. The Court of Justice has consistently underlined that the very existence of an effective judicial review by national courts designed to ensure compliance with EU law is the essence of the rule of law in European Union. The rule of law ensures that member states and their citizens can work together in a spirit of mutual trust, trust in public institutions, including in the justice system, is absolutely crucial for the smooth functioning of democratic societies. Rule of law and fundamental rights are strictly linked Fundamental rights cannot be effectively applied for the benefit of the people without the respect of rule of law. Thus, upholding the rule of law will continue to be our priority. I would also like to underline that our new funding in the justice program will help train judges on the rule of law and on the application of the charter. Madame Malgorzata is either technically correcting something or waving to me that I should stop speaking. No, it's no, no, not no. the time Please control. Please continue. <laughs> we still okay. have some time, Madame Commissioner. Uh, because you would have stopped me in a dramatic moment. <laughs> I have not said, I've said everything yet. Uh, because I also want to speak about civil society organizations and rights defenders. Civil society organizations and independent national human rights bodies, such as national human rights institutions, 
are also key actors for the charges enforcement. They are instrumental in raising people's awareness about their rights and helping them receive effective judicial protection. They are also key partners for us in the efforts to promote and protect fundamental rights, democracy, and the rule of law. I cannot underline enough the importance of independent national human rights bodies abiding by the international standards of the UN Paris principles. And I would like also to praise in particular Mr. Bodnar for all the work he did as chair of the Polish National Human Rights Institution, despite all the pressures he was put under and confronted with. I confirm that we are following closely and with concern the developments relating to his office of the Polish Ombudsman. Now, regarding the funding for civil society and human rights institutions, the Commission's new funding program called Citizens' Equality, Rights and Values Programme has a budget of 1.55 billion uh, euro for seven years. It aims at turning our policy objectives into action and support civil society organizations and rights defenders to protect fundamental rights and promote a culture of values in the EU. It is the biggest EU fund for supporting fundamental rights inside the EU, and I want to invite you to use it well. The Commission services are at your disposal for further information. This funding program will also be to a certain extent open to national and local authorities, national and local administrations, parliaments and law enforcement authorities are central to promoting and protecting charter rights and creating an enabling environment for civil society and rights defenders. And we want to work hand in hand and to support them in complying with the charter when they implement EU law. We hope to see good projects in response to our calls for proposals. We would, for instance, welcome good projects of cooperation between cities. Cities have an important role to play to promote a culture of values and protect the fundamental rights of their citizens. Much can be achieved by pooling positive experiences. A number of cities have now joined the network of human rights cities and embed fundamental rights in their policymaking. This is a trend we would like to encourage. Another element we would like to stress, in particular at the start of a new budgetary period, is that EU-funded projects need to comply with the EU law, including the Charter. We have taken concrete steps to help member states to ensure that projects funded by EU, from their in <coughs> inception to their implementation, are fully compliant with the Charter. And this is something I will be particularly attentive to. And I said many times that we are not going to fund uh, those policies which promote the no zones for LGBT people. This is not the place for EU funding because the EU funding has to see the full respect for, for the fundamental rights. And we as EU institutions must also be beyond reproach when it comes to applying the Charter. And we will continue to ensure that the core principles are upheld within the EU's legislative and policy work, especially in areas like the digital transformation and the green transition or social rights, migration and security. <clears throat> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in our strategy, we have invited member states to designate a fundamental rights charter focal point to facilitate the exchange and pra of practices and foster cooperation on charter use and awareness between the different levels of governments with civil society and human rights bodies and across the European countries. In December, we will publish the report looking at how the charter is applied, including in the member states. We will select each year a different theme to report on. For this year, it will be fundamental rights in digital era. I would like this report to trigger fruitful discussions on the application of the charter, including in national parliaments and institutions. 
In March this year, member states agreed on the joint work on fundamental rights for the 10 years to come. They show complete adherence to the Commission's strategy. And we have a clear work plan. And I stand ready to assist this and make it a success. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. These were very clear words. And we have already questions to you on uh, our Facebook. Uh, we'll get back to them. But let me first get uh, the screen to uh, director of the Agency of uh, um, Fundamental Rights, Przejda Teraz Napolski, Pan Director Michael O'Flaherty. Now, is... Director Michael O'Flaherty, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. It's a really great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Commission representation for co-organizing the event with us. I'd like to uh, warmly thank and welcome Vice President Yoruba and the other distinguished speakers. Dear friends, whenever I speak about human rights and values in a Polish context, I do it with a good deal of deference and even diffidence. I am, after all, speaking in a country context, uh, the country that produced Irena Sendlerova, one of the greatest and bravest humanitarians of all time. Poland is also the country of Agnieszka Holland, who through film forces us to confront and learn from our histories. Poland is the country of Tadeusz Mazowiecki, for whom I had the honor to serve. He was my first boss in the United Nations when he was the UN Special Rapporteur for former Yugoslavia. And Poland, of course, is the country of Pavel Adamowicz, who showed us so recently uh, with his own life what it means to put human rights and values at the heart of a city. These names, in other words, remind us of how often we look to polls to show us how to deliver the necessary leadership for ethical societies. These examples are more needed than ever today. We've already heard of some of the problems our societies face in the words of Vice President Yoruba. Uh, we're all reeling today uh, from the shocking incidents, incident in Belarus over the weekend. But instead of going through the, the litany of the things that are not working in our societies, if I could just stay for a moment on the story of COVID. It's been 15, 15 months now. Our societies, frankly, are wounded and tired. Everybody has been impacted, but different generations have been hit in different ways. We focused on old people early, uh, quite correctly, early in the days of the pandemic. And now we look to young people and children, and we worry about their futures. We've seen the extraordinary extent to which COVID exposed pre-existing inequalities and made them worse in our societies. Uh, and of course, we've seen in at least some places how authorities took advantage of the pandemic uh, to um, use law in an abusive manner. So what do we do? Uh, where do we look for a guidebook uh, to navigate uh, to a better future? Well, human rights must be central uh, to that navigation. And again, here in figuring out what that must look like, I turn to polls. I, I, I think, for example, of Raphael Lemkin, uh, one of the great pre-authors, uh, pre-designers of the human rights system through the crafting of the crime of genocide. I think of my friend Jide Keja, who is the, I would say, under-acknowledged uh, principal author of the Vienna Declaration and Programme of Action. The Vienna Declaration and Programme of Action adopted just over 25 years ago has set much of the agenda to strengthen the human rights system globally ever since. The Vienna Declaration points to law as being at the heart of the human rights system, treaties and the other instruments. And of course, today uh, we're gathering virtually uh, to acknowledge and discuss uh, the most foundational of those legal instruments in an EU context, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. My friends, the Charter of Fundamental Rights is a remarkable instrument, groundbreaking. In the first place, I, it puts together in one single instrument, in a joined up manner, uh, the protection of civil rights, political rights, economic, social and cultural rights. Second, to the extent that it addresses rights that are familiar from, let's say, the European Convention on Human Rights, it goes further. It expands those rights. 
for example, the due process of law uh, and administration of justice protections uh, in the Charter are considerably stronger than those to be found in the European Convention. We find not just expanded, but we find new rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We find an explicit right uh, to protection of rights in the context of the environment, the rights of older people, an explicit right of asylum, even a right to establish a business. And regardless of which rights we're talking about, right across the instrument, we see a profound respect for universality of rights and of the need to not only protect, but to celebrate the astonishing diversity of our peoples, regardless of ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or whichever other category. And finally, in terms of this being a remarkable instrument, we have, of course, its powerful domestic legal effect, quite unlike that to be found in, let us say, the United Nations treaties. Of course, I acknowledge uh, that the Charter is only applicable within the scope of the application of EU law. But this is not much of a restraint. EU law runs right across our administrations, right across the governance of our societies. So how are we doing? Well, as we've already heard from Vice President Jourova, uh, we could do better. Uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency, on an ongoing basis, is measuring the application of the Charter across the EU institutions and the member states. And at all levels, we see that a further push is needed. The courts, yes, of course, the Charter is referred to. Yes, questions are put to the European Court of Justice, but less than you might expect. Parliaments, you'd expect the Charter to be much more visible in the act of lawmaking. Uh, and it's, it's not. Government. Uh, we would expect governments to be actively promoting the Charter. We don't see much evidence of that anywhere. And even in civil society, when we checked just a few months ago, we saw that civil society itself concedes that the Charter does not play sufficiently uh, a large a role uh, uh, within their own operations. It's in this context that we so warm, warmly welcome the leadership by Vice President Jourova and the uh, rollout of the, the strategy uh, on the EU Charter. And the Fundamental Rights Agency will do everything within its appropriate role uh, to support the delivery of that strategy. We welcome in particular within the strategy, the emphasis uh, on the importance of institutions, of protecting and strengthening the national human rights infrastructure. And this, of course, goes well beyond the bodies of the state. And let me, uh, as did the Vice President, concentrate on some elements of the architecture uh, outside state institutions. In the first place, national human rights institutions. Uh, I want to echo what we've already heard. NHRIs play a vital role uh, for a healthy human rights uh, uh, um, culture within a society. And I want to uh, echo what the Vice President said in, in deep appreciation and respect for Adam Bodnar and the leadership that he has given and continues to give uh, in the role of the National Human Rights Institution in Poland. A second of the uh, institutions that I want to mention this morning is equality bodies. Not much that I want to say about them today, other than that I, that I welcome the extent to which they're getting attention right now as we mark 20 years of the equality directives uh, and the recognition increasingly given now uh, to the need to strengthen equality bodies, uh, their mandates, but also the resources available to them. And then of course, there's civil society. Civil society is the lifeblood of a thriving human rights culture within any society. And that's why the Fundamental Rights Agency, as with NHRIs, will stay very focused on finding ways to offer support. We published a report a few years back on the state of civil society in the EU. We're publishing a second edition of it in coming months. And frankly, we're worried. Uh, the new report is still being drafted, so I can't speak to its specific contents, but I would have to say that we see uh, multiple forms of pressure on civil society in different parts of the EU. We see, for example, uh, limits being put on the fundraising capacity of civil society, such as with regard to access to foreign funding. And we see uh, pressure being put on groups because of the work they do. 
So for example, in some places, groups that work on LGBTI issues get targeted in a way that groups working on something else do not. And this is obviously a matter of great concern. Now, as we go forward in addressing these and all the other issues, uh, I want to assure you that you can count on the continued solidarity of the Fundamental Rights Agency. We will continue to generate the comparative data to help us all to shine a light on the realities. That's the, an important context for the surveys that we do on the experience of minorities on violence against women, just to take two examples. We will continue also to uh, generate the qualitative socio-legal research that we need to map our way through difficult new realities, such as that of the digitalization of our lives and the application of artificial intelligence. We will continue to offer capacity building support, including at the level of member states. Take, to take today, obviously, as the example being so in supporting the, um, the use of the charter at the national level. And here, I, by the way, I should mention that we have produced a number of tools uh, to promote use of the charter, uh, including many of which have been translated into Polish. For example, you can access on our website a handbook on the use of the charter at the national level, which, as I say, is now available in Polish. And finally, in terms of how we will continue to support you, we will continue to use our convening power uh, in support of promotion and strengthening of fundamental rights, including at the national level. We will, for example, in October, uh, uh, conduct the third fundamental rights forum, uh, where all of the different people who speak about all of the actors, institutions who care about human rights within the EU have a chance to come and speak to each other about strengthening human rights and fundamental rights in the EU. And I very much look forward to a strong Polish engagement in both the physical and the online dimensions of the Fundamental Rights Forum coming up in October. But let me conclude now, and I'd like to conclude by recalling the words of another great Pole. And that Pole is, is of course, Pope John Paul II. John Paul II championed human rights. Uh, read the speech he gave at the United Nations General Assembly in September 1979, a tour de force defense uh, of all that had been achieved in the area of human rights since the Second World War. And in that speech, he used the following words. He said, although each person lives in a particular concrete social and historical context, every human being is endowed with a dignity that must never be lessened, impaired or destroyed but must instead be respected and safeguarded. That's the end of the quote. And my friends, that is what human rights is all about. That is the purpose of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director. And what you said, I'm, I'm personally being a Pole, I'm very proud that so many Polish names were quoted. And some of the names, it's not only the name for us, but it will be our speaker in the um, very few minutes, but uh, let me get back to Madam Commissioner now, Madam Vice President. There are some questions dedicated to you, but my personal question, also referring to the quote uh, uh, which was used just now, uh, how would you comment the situation which we have in Belarus right now? We just know, uh, got to know that the Polish airlines stopped flights to Belarus. And we are talking today uh, during the EU summit, uh, which started yesterday. So, Madam Vice President, what would be your comment to this situation? Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, the Polish airlines uh, took the proper decision to stop the flights, as well as, as many other, other uh, com uh, travel com uh, companies, because uh, this is also one of the decisions of the European Council from yesterday. Well, what is my personal comment? I am afraid I will not be original uh, because everybody who is watching what's happening is shocked and uh, we uh, are missing words. Uh, and at the same time, we are saying it requires action. And I think it is also about the special role of us, if I can say Easterners, where I belong to as a, as a Czech uh, uh, a, a citizen, uh, to decipher or decrypt the messages from Russia and Belarus to the EU. To, because I, in the past, I saw a lot of underestimating or lack of imagination of what we can expect 
from mainly Russia, but also from, from Belarus. And now we see that uh, President uh, Lukashenko showed that uh, he can do anything. And we have to say back, no, you cannot do these things. And uh, the response of the EU has to be uh, unanimous and has, has to be firm and concrete. So I expect a reaction. Of course, we have to play with the, with the instruments we have in hand. So it's mainly the diplomatic and economic sanctions. Of course, the reorganization of the travel, uh, it, it is the, the practical uh, co uh, uh, consequence of, of what happened. Uh, uh, this uh, this is clearly the, the hijacking uh, organized by the state, so, so we have to react. For the sanctions, I think that we have not uh, exhausted yet the economic sanctions. Uh, and we, uh, I think, have to show more solidarity with Belarusian people, because I spoke to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya several times. I always had a strange feeling that we could do more, we should do more. We have deployed uh, quite a lot of money to help the, the Belarusian people, the NGOs uh, operating on the territory of Belarus, the journalists. And this is also a, a, an outrageous story about uh, how Lukashenko's regime is, is approaching and dealing with the journalists who are doing their job being critical uh, on, on the regime. Unfortunately, we, we have a problem to get the money to the, to the places where it's needed. And uh, so now we start to draft a new chapter in this eu belarusian uh, relationship. And uh, as Ursula von der Leyen said, this is the attack against the sovereignty of the EU. So I, I expect that the reaction will be as strong as possible within the boundaries of what, what we, we can do diplomatically and economically. I think we just have to face the fact that uh, only, well, we have to just admit that the, we are circulated by more and more authoritarian regimes and these regimes are closer and closer to the EU borders. So we have to also think about Russia and the other countries which don't really uh, not, respect not only, human rights. Not only around EU, they are creeping inside the EU. And so, as far as this, let me move to the next question, because it's an important one for the Polish uh, civil society. Maybe even as the director can, uh, can answer from Marcin Gurski is the question about Polish NGOs who want to fight for uh, keeping um, human rights standards in Poland. Is there any measures which the uh, agency or commission can take to support civil society uh, in Poland? If you'd like me to go first, is that right? Um, yes. Okay, because I think Vice President Jurova could speak to uh, all of the work the Commission is doing. But we as an agency were very concerned, as I said, uh, about pressures on civil society right across the EU, including in Poland. Uh, we see, uh, we see uh, threat and harassment, we see financial pressure, regulatory pressure, a lack of access to decision makers, a lack of meaningful consultation, uh, uh, and, and, and it, it expresses itself in different ways in different places. Uh, but uh, there's, there, the, the, the space for civil society to operate is under pressure right now. The Fundamental Rights Agency is engaging that uh, within its own limit, the limits of its own mandate, above all by reporting on the story, uh, by doing that comparative analysis repeatedly. We'll have our second report in September, which will show changes over time. And frankly, I don't see any great improvement over time. Actually, we see a deterioration in some places. Uh, so we feel an important part of our role is getting that evidence out there so that policymakers can engage. We also um, maintain a platform of civil society, which has something like 800 organizations participating. And we want that platform to increasingly be not just a place where civil society engages with each other and with us, but that it has an element of being a protective space, whereby coming together on the platform, uh, civil society mutually can better protect each other and we can play a role there as well. And, um, and finally, as I mentioned, we create the opportunity for civil society to to engage uh, and we try to create the links with the decision and the policy makers above all else through the periodic convening of the fundamental rights forum but that they're the limited actions within our mandate that the fundamental rights agency plays but our commitment is 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 is, is you can be uh, is something of which you can be absolutely sure thank you, thank you for this answer madam vice president uh, the question was also directed to you 
Yeah, I, I spoke too long before, so now I will try to be short. Well, I think that we need uh, three things. Uh, serious and full recognition of the work of the NGOs and the function in the society. We have in the European Democracy Action Plan a chapter about the role of the civil society, uh, about the active citizens that we, we uh, they are, they play absolutely crucial role in protecting uh, democracy in, in the member states. So the recognition is, is the first thing. And uh, the second, legal protection. So we want to strengthen further the equality, equality bodies, which could also serve as the, as the, the hubs for, for getting advice or, or even legal aid. Uh, this is this is my dream that we will strengthen the equality bodies in this direction, and legal protection. I mean, also for instance, the the anti-slap legislation which I am working on, which should also cover the human rights defenders and protection, uh, uh, their protection against the abusive litigations, and the third funding. Uh, I mentioned the program uh, which we have uh, centralized here. We 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 will try to fund the. The, the good projects where they are needed, uh, but uh, I mean the, the big package, the, the big pile of money, the recovery fund, well, we really did a lot in the commission. Uh, it was my personal effort to uh, embed a sufficient, uh, how, to, how to say it, space for, for the funding where the civil society organizations can 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 uh, which which can be used by them because they will play incredibly important role especially in post covid time just just imagine we spoke about the charter yes and sometimes we slip into rather uh, uh, theoretical or uh, even academic discussion but where are uh, uh, coming back to practice when uh, where are all the 15 percent of children who were not delivered any education in the last one and a half year because they are poor and because they don't have the the bloody ipad or a pc at home mm -hmm. you know you know there is the work now for the organizations of, of course for the schools but but for many also volunteers uh, to work uh, for for the families which which are falling down due to COVID, uh, just an example. So so we have to do three uh, three these three things, and we we try to do that as as the commission. Thank you for this clear statement, Madam Vice President. And uh, let me move on now to the first round, and we have very interesting speakers uh, now. Let me switch to Polish. Ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to talk about how the Charter is being applied in practice. Uh, for the first round, we have invited three people who are best suited to talk about it. I would like to invite Professor Nina Putorak, Judge at the General Court of the European Union, Court of Justice of the European Union. Hello, Madam Professor. Hello, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Kamila gasiuk pihovic Member of Parliament uh, and Vice President of the Justice and Human Rights Committee of the Polish Sejm. Hello. Yes, hello. Welcome, uh, everybody. And uh, uh, Adam Bodnar, uh, who was, in fact, mentioned by both our speakers beforehand. Congratulations on your very successful term of office and thank you for joining us. Hello, welcome. I am very happy to be able to hear. To, to be here and to, to join you. I think all three of you uh, are among the Polish names that are uh, in this day and age associated with uh, fundamental rights. So I will start with Madam Judge, a legal question. As a lawyer, how would you describe the meaning of the Charter? What has changed as compared to the 90s when it comes to what we have now in the European legal system because of the Lisbon Treaty and this Charter? Thank you for the question. But before I respond, before I answer, I would like to thank you for inviting me here to take part in this debate. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank you for this initiative because reminding us about the Charter uh, is one of the key elements uh, of uh, the operation and the oper uh, operability of the Charter as, the, in the, as a legal instrument. When it comes to the significance of the Charter, it's uh, difficult to 
overestimated. And it's not because the Charter is introducing any new specific freedoms or rights that have been previously unknown or that it, it assigns some new competencies to the member states of the EU, because it does not. But the Charter does uh, provide coding basis for the fundamental rights that have been operating uh, in the European Union. It is equal to treaties uh, when it comes to the legal role. And uh, uh, so uh, it, it is uh, in a way an authority that is uh, necessary in the legal system that is um, based on democracy and the rule of law. I'm in, in order to explain that, we would have to mention that uh, fundamental rights um, have been functioning within the European communities and now in the European Union. They have been functioning for years. Uh, um, it all started at least in the 70s uh, when uh, the uh, European Court of Justice mentioned fundamental rights. Uh, they were also mentioned in the Maastricht Treaty uh, and later um, treaties of the European Union. But the issue of fundamental rights has never been in the foreground. Um, the European Union was not perceived um, as an organization uh, um, whose role is to um, protect uh, fundamental rights. This changed with the introduction of the Charter. As uh, um, first, it was not a binding instrument, but uh, starting in 2009, after the Lisbon Treaty, it was a legally binding uh, act. The purpose of the Charter was to make uh, the uh, rights uh, in the European system more visible and to strengthen the protection of fundamental rights uh, uh, by this. And this purpose is being implemented. Uh, for the 20 years of its functioning, the Charter received a fundamental significance for the protection uh, of uh, the uh, private uh, entities of the European Union. The Charter is applied at all the levels of the European authority, at the legislative level, uh, uh, where it is becoming a fundament for different uh, uh, legislative initiatives or it serves as an inspiration for such initiatives. It is also applied by the European institutions uh, which enforce the European law, in particular by the European Commission, and very frequently it also comes up in case law uh, of the uh, European Court, which is the European Court of um, uh, uh, yeah, um, the national courts. Uh, I would like to ask this question in the second round, and using the opportunity that we also have here, the second important institution, which is the parliament. So I would like to ask a member of parliament, Kamila gasiuk pichovic a question from your perspective. Uh, well, it is your first term of office, no, the second term of office uh, in the parliament, and you are a lawyer as well. It is important. Uh, uh, how would you describe the significance of the charter uh, for the application uh, of uh, the law uh, in different member states? Uh, the adoption of the Charter of Fundamental Rights as a binding document, in my opinion, should be considered to be the most, one of the most important points in the history of the European integration. Because from being uh, the economic community, we moved on to a very clear and transparent declaration of the same values in the fundamental area. The Charter does not only provide uh, for the guarantee of fundamental rights, but it also is an element which facilitates the deepening of the European integration. But certainly, if we ask a question, what significance the Charter of Fundamental Rights has uh, for uh, making uh, the law in individual member states, in every country, the answer will be different. I can say what it is like in Poland. Unfortunately, we see how year on year in Poland, the Charter and the rights guaranteed in it uh, uh, has a lesser and lesser significance. And we can see how under the current conditions, the authority uh, is uh, taking uh, the fundamental rights very lightly. Uh, uh, it doesn't really care about the Constitution, the European treaties, or the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. Unfortunately, uh, in recent uh, you know months, uh, the fundamental rights of citizens uh, in Poland uh, became a target of the authorities. They were violated in the past as well, but the last year has been particularly difficult. 
We have to say that in Poland, uh, next to thousands of people who died in the result of the pandemic, unfortunately, uh, civil rights and human rights also fell victim uh, to the pandemic. And we uh, have uh, seen uh, the unprecedented attacks on the most fundamental of those rights. In recent months, we have had to do with, uh, you know, prosecution, uh, um, well, persecution of independent judges, uh, the campaign of hatred against LGBT and uh, illegal deprivation of um, uh, the protection by by Polish ombudsman uh, of the citizens, as well as uh, the legal uh, defect uh, connected uh, with the um, wrongly uh, man, the constitutional court, and then this uh, decision uh, depriving women of the right of abortion and, uh, you know, uh, withdrawing from the uh, Istanbul uh, uh, Convention. That is why in the process of lawmaking and in the process of different activities, uh, well, that would be really perfect for every parliament to do that. But uh, talking about the example of Poland, we have to pay attention to a very special situation here. Today, Polish citizens de facto have been deprived of the right of impartial court. And Article 47 of the Charter has been uh, really sort of rejected. Uh, the politicians of the current authority have more influence on the, the system of justice than it was the case during the communist Poland against the law. They introduced their nominees to the so-called National uh, Council for the Judiciary. Uh, they established the institution that became a, an, a, a tool of oppression against independent judges. Uh, the judges who pronounce the verdict uh, the current authority doesn't like, those who, who ask uh, uh, legal questions to the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is directly guaranteed in the treaties, became target of political persecution. And everything is happening under the veil of disciplinary proceedings against them. And those are the cases of Judge Igor Tuleja and the Judge of Rubel, uh, Judges uh, Jurek, Juszczyszyn, uh, Judge Morawiec, they are also being persecuted. When we take into account that a politician, Minister of Justice today has the right to issue orders to all the prosecutors in Poland, under these conditions, there is no possibility to talk about the right to impartial court. One of the most obvious rights in practice in my country does not work anymore. So I would like to draw your attention to another very important aspect of what is happening in Poland. An additional guarantee uh, uh, for the fundamental rights not to be taken very lightly has always been provided by the uh, Office uh, of the Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights has frequently referred to the Charter. And now, after the unlawful decisions of the current authorities, uh, which actually terminate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the service of Adam Bodnar, Poland is going to become a peculiar country uh, where the Ombudsman Institution is not going to operate anymore. The warning for everyone should be here the dictatorship of Lukashenko, a man who uh, uh, makes a passenger plane uh, hijacked and citizens abducted. And now uh, the citizens uh, of Belarus can only uh, uh, yell and that's it. And we, let's not allow for any member states to go down to the level of dictatorship of Lukashenko. There will be no possibility to talk about safe and secure Europe if we allow uh, such a situation in Belarus. It will, it will make others brave. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, well, Deputy, can we stop it now? So this against the violation of fundamental uh, rights. So we have to protest against it, regardless whether it is in the European country, in Russia, in Belarus or in Turkey. Let's go back to Poland, because the position about Belarus is very clear abroad, uh, in a broader sense against Belarus, as well as similar practices in other countries. But Adam Bodnar was referred to. Um, uh, well, uh, Professor, uh, uh, well, uh, Deputy Pichowicz already said that your office has been applying the Charter frequently. I would like to ask you a question uh, in your capacity of a lawyer, but also a commissioner for human rights. What does the existence of this Charter mean uh, for the European system? Once again, I would like to thank you very much for extending the invitation to me and for giving me the possibility to participate in uh, this webinar. I would like to thank very uh, uh, much for very nice words of uh, uh, Vice, uh, um, Vice uh, President uh, Vera Jourova as well as Michael O'Flery for uh, what I've been doing and for the support I have been receiving from you. I want to thank you very much. I think that if it hadn't been for an active position of the European Commission, everything would be really looking worse than it is looking now. Uh, and I think that thanks to the engagement of the European support, there is an opportunity here that although there are different problems, but the new uh, Commissioner for Human Rights uh, will be um, uh, elected uh, on the basis of the constitutional uh, procedure. If it is really going to be the case, this unfortunately 
unfortunate uh, verdict of the constitutional court will be minimized in terms of the um, uh, legal uh, consequences in our office we are trying to still do our job but everything depends when there, whether the deadline which is the 15th of july for the um, election of the uh, new commissioner according to the polish constitution will be adhered to the charter of fundamental rights for the office of the of the commissioner for human rights uh, since the beginning has been incredibly important it's been important uh, just well as an inspiration but also as an argument in different actions that we take for the respect of the rights and freedoms of an individual before I, I became uh, uh, the commissioner i know that in the office of the commissioner many activities um, uh, were taken uh, one of my associates director miroslav Wrublewski, for many years was um, a member of the board of the agency of fundamental rights of the european union and that is why uh, he became an ambassador of the charter uh, for the office of the commissioner but also for poland because he took up a number of different promotional activities and publications uh, connected with the the application of the Charter of Fundamental Rights as well as its uh, presence in the legal system. I think that the main problem uh, which we had with the Charter was the problem which was connected with the, um, with the um, uh, original sin uh, here. First of all, the Charter was not legally binding for quite many years and only uh, when the Lisbon Treaty was adopted, uh, uh, it became um, binding. Secondly, Poland also adopted this unfortunate um, uh, Polish-British Protocol, which limited not really the application uh, of the Charter because, uh, well, at the end it didn't have any mental uh, significance, but it created a mental barrier uh, for the uh, actual implementation of the Charter as well as promotion. I think it was one of the greatest uh, mistakes of the government of Donald Tusk, that Donald Tusk did not withdraw from the Polish-British protocol when he could have done that. Uh, and there was this atmosphere, <coughs> let's not care about the protocol, it doesn't really matter. There is no legal significance of that. But in the result of that charter couldn't go so deep and it couldn't be enrooted in the imagination of lawyers very deeply because many th people were thinking whether or not it is binding or perhaps not binding. But now we have no doubts that it is binding and that it is important. From the perspective of the work of the Office of the Commissioner, the charter is very helpful as uh, the um, uh, basis for our general addresses, and especially when we are demanding the implementation of the European law. And this is for the support of the arguments. It's not only about the implementation of different mechanisms pertaining to the derivative law, but that this charter is an additional reasoning for these actions. Secondly, the charter is useful for us to take different additional actions which are connected with a full respect for rights and freedoms, in particular in the context of different proceedings in Polish courts. So the Office for the Commissioner of Human Rights has significant possibilities to participate uh, in court proceedings. We do participate in these proceedings uh, at the, the national as well as at the international level. Now, I would like to draw your attention to one very important aspect which we were able to develop in our office, largely thanks to the support of Professor Maciej Taborowski. We have the possibility to join national uh, proceedings before administrative courts as well as civil courts. <coughs> and if we are a party, to the proceedings and if a court uh, asks uh, the question for the uh, legal opinion to the European Court of Justice, then automatically we are becoming a party of the proceedings before the European Court, uh, 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 the European Court of Justice. And that is uh, uh, when the articles, Article 7 is important, uh, the fight for the independence of the judiciary. This article is referred to in different ways as the supplementation of Article 19 of the Treaty on the European Union, which is the uh, principle of the effective legal protection, which is binding in the EU. I also would like to stress Article 21, which is the ban on discrimination, because we are also involved in cases against um, the discrimination. There is one uh, question for pre preliminary ruling that was asked in the result of our uh, motion by an administrative court, and that is the question about the rights of children uh, who, who are uh, being brought up in uh, same-sex uh, uh, relationships and the right uh, for those um, uh, children to get citizenship. And it is one of the very important aspects which is going to be, I hope, solved by the Court of Justice of the European Union.
So the charter has a significant importance for the office today from the perspective of the strategic mitigation, uh, strategic proceedings, as well as uh, the conduct. Here we can use uh, the legal uh, the legal edge uh, to uh, what this charter serves. But I would like to note that this is not only about the activity of the Office of the Commissioner, but also it is about the activity of different non-governmental organizations that are specialized in it. For example, the Helsinki Human Rights Foundation. Uh, sometimes it even uh, leads to some unprecedented cases. An interesting subject where the charter is used in the context uh, of uh, the election to the European Parliament. Uh, on the basis of the Polish constitution, uh, people who are incapacitated, they are not allowed to participate in parliamentary or presidential elections, etc. But our legislature sort of automatically expanded this ban also on the election to the European Parliament. And now it turns out uh, that thanks to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, as well as thanks to the fact that the right to vote uh, in uh, the uh, elections to the European Parliament is vested at all the, all the citizens of the European Union. It was possible to bring uh, the uh, uh, verdict uh, of one of the district courts that allowed a person who is incapacitated to participate um, uh, in uh, the election to the European Parliament, which is against our constitution, but it is in line with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. All right, can we uh, stop for a moment? Because we will uh, give more examples in a moment, I believe. But I would like to ask a question uh, uh, of uh, Madam Vice President and the Director. Comment on what you've heard from your Polish colleagues, Madam Vice President. Yes, what is the question? I, I was so uh, so uh, vigilantly listening to Adam that <laughs> I was just uh, I was just wondering if you have anything to say uh, addressing what uh, our Polish colleagues said, especially. Uh, Madam Kamila Gasiuk Pichowicz about uh, the the problem between the legal situation and the, the laws and the politics in a member state. Oh well, yes, uh, I, uh, when I, I I fully agree that that there, there is uh, a plenty of issues and we try to uh, address them uh, also vis-a-vis -vis Poland, be it by by the dialogue or by by uh, by legal instruments. And this dilemma, whether it is a legal problem or political problem, um, whether we can remain legalistic or whether we should be more principled, it's every day on my table. And I think that, uh, of course, uh, the commission has to abide by the rule of law itself or herself, maybe the commission is a woman after all, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we have to be able to strengthen the, the political dialogue with the member states and to start discussing the negative trends from the scratch. So this is what we missed in Poland because the reform came uh, overnight. I remember sometimes in December, 2015, as a shock, as a big surprise, and it was late. It was late, although, of course, there were indications already in the campaign before the elections, yeah, that the the, the right and justice party wants to wants to reform the judiciary, and we are applauding reforms of judiciary in the member states. We are supporting the reforms, but of course. Uh, the reforms which respect the basic principle of the rule of law and division of powers, uh, which uh, not only in my view is not the case uh, of the Polish justice reform. So uh, we introduced the rule of law, a new report to have the early dialogue. I will not mention the, the countries where it already helped. Two countries, one, the, one West, one Eastern, uh, where we started the dialogue early on after the first annual report last year. And uh, we explained to each other how the reform should look like and the commission sh shared the concerns and the, the, the states uh, thought over uh, whether it should not be done differently. So, you know, I, I believe in dialogue and uh, uh, okay, we... let's let's hope that this brings some results. I just want uh, also to ask Mr. O'Flaherty uh, if you have any comments to what you've heard. 
Sure, thank you. I've listened with deep respect uh, to the commentary so far. Uh, and um, I, the, my first reaction is one of, 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 um, of respect and solidarity. Um, if I'm not Polish, I'm not living in Poland, I'm not living in the day-to-day -day reality. Uh, and um, it's important to take opportunities like this to listen actively and to, and to get a, a, as profound an understanding as possible. But the second reaction I have is, 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 is to recall that um, societies are very resilient. Um, the, 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 the upholding of values is, 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 is something that, um, that, 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 that is more or less impossible to quash anywhere. Uh, and uh, we should be very hopeful uh, in any society uh, under pressure. Uh, in, in terms of that capacity of civil society and of the champions of values uh, to ultimately win out. Um, I would also like to express appreciation um, to institutions that are not Polish, but are playing such an important role in upholding uh, values and freedoms in Poland. Uh, and that's for uh, perhaps above all else, the European Court of Justice. Uh, which has repeatedly ruled uh, and, and given guidance. Um, I see most recently on the 20th of May, the uh, opinion of the Advocate General Bobek on the issue of secondment of judges, the latest important mm -hmm. intervention from the court. Um, mm -hmm. I think but that's as much as I could say at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director. Uh, and uh, Judge Poutorak, if I may, I would like to uh, revisit the examples. Uh, Professor Bodnar mentioned some of them from the perspective of the commissioner. But Professor, could you give us more information about the case law uh, and then show to us in which cases uh, the uh, European Court of Justice uh, and uh, the court that you represent uh, speaks um, uh, here about the charter and what is the division of the competencies? Well, I would like to combine the answer to the question with a comment about the significance of the charter, because here we were talking about uh, the irregularities uh, or the crisis of uh, the uh, uh, rule of law and uh, the uh, independence of the judiciary in Poland. This crisis uh, highlighted the significance of the charter for the legal system because the charter started to come up in the case law of the Court of Justice in the context of Article 47, which is the right to independent court. And it started to come up more and more frequently. Uh, the case law of uh, the uh, European Court of Justice significantly expanded the understanding of Article 47 and the application of Article 47 in cases pertaining to the independence of the judiciary, independence of court. This situation, uh, the crisis uh, of the rule of law, led to the point when the Charter and Article 47 of the Charter comes up also in the legislation, uh, in uh, the case law of the Polish courts very frequently. We are even having a, an avalanche of the questions for preliminary ruling from uh, the Polish courts about Article 47, as well as the questions connected with the independence of the court. And currently, it is the most frequently referred uh, provision of the Charter uh, in the questions for preliminary ruling not only from Polish courts, but also courts of other member states. There are questions about the independence of the German courts, uh, Maltese courts, Romanian courts, uh, or Spanish courts. That is uh, why the significance of the Charter uh, uh, was or has been uh, strongly highlighted uh, by the questions which are connected with some uh, threat uh, to the independence of the judiciary. But I would like also to draw your attention to another aspect. The Charter is also referred to by the European Commission in the complaints to the Court of Justice against the member states on, not on the failure to execute their commitments related to the European Union. And in these cases, Article 47 of the Charter is also frequently referred to. Of course, it is really very difficult to quote groups um, uh, or examples of um, uh, case law uh, of the Court of Justice or national courts that would be representative because there are very many decisions here. Uh, let me just remind you of the fact that the Court of Justice uh, uh, can uh, evaluate uh, the decisions of the European uh, institutions uh, pertaining to their uh, compliance with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And the Court of Justice found, for example, the lack of validity of several acts of European law as uh, uh, those which violated the rights resulting from the Charter. That was, for example, about the 
directive on data retention uh, in electronic communications. Uh, the Court of Justice can also evaluate uh, the activity uh, of uh, the uh, states uh, as to their compliance with the Charter uh, also. Uh, and well, there are not really many decisions uh, similar to that, but they do happen. Let me just uh, remind you of the recent example from last year uh, when the failure to fulfill uh, the uh, obligations towards the European Union by Hungary were found it connected uh, with the activity of uh, foreign higher education institutions. And the most numerous uh, uh, groups uh, group uh, from the Court of Justice is the answers to the questions for preliminary ruling asked by national courts. As I mentioned, uh, the most frequently raised problem in the questions for preliminary ruling in connection with the Charter uh, are the questions related to Article 47, access to independent court, most frequently in the context of the independence of court. But here I would like also to mention the question from the Chief Administrative Court, which was also based on Article 47 of the Charter, but it did not apply uh, to the independence of court, but it, uh, it was connected with uh, the uh, well, uh, lack of possibility to appeal, to appeal to court in the visa procedure. In the result, uh, of that question for preliminary ruling, uh, the uh, European Court of Justice uh, found the Polish law uh, be uh, in conflict with the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the necessary legislative provisions were uh, changed or implemented. There are many examples of uh, such uh, jurisprudence. Uh, Commissioner Bodnar mentioned here the uh, question uh, for preliminary ruling uh, of the regional court in, uh, in uh, uh, Wrocław, where Article 21 of the Charter was referred to, which is the provision on the uh, ban on discrimination that was in the context of the refusal to recognize uh, the uh, act uh, uh, of birth, the, the birth certificate of a child uh, in which uh, same-sex persons who are quoted as parents. We can see uh, that these are very practical cases. It is not far distance, far-fetched, abstract stuff. It is something that can concern all of us. And I think that we will talk about it in the second round. But before we move on to that, I would like to go back to Adam Bodnar. You are uh, bringing uh, your term of office to an end. And now uh, I would like to ask how you would evaluate uh, with uh, which uh, 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 provisions of the law uh, we are having uh, to do. How would you sum up your term of office? Uh, what uh, was the most frequent problem you had to tackle with? I think that the most important things were listed many times. Namely, I would mention articles well, 47, the right to independent court, uh, Article 21, ban on discrimination. I would like to add another provision here that I think uh, is slightly underestimated by us. And I think uh, it is very important politically in Poland because the Charter of Fundamental Rights contains one stipulation that refers specifically to institutions, to the fact that the institutions that are meant to defend somebody's rights that should have an independent status. I'm talking about Article 8, Paragraph 3 of the Charter saying that the observation of uh, uh, the laws uh, de, um, um, focusing on uh, data protection is controlled or supervised by an independent institution. And there was a case years ago um, associated with the commissioner from Hungary um, whose term of office uh, was shortened, was abbreviated. Why am I noting this uh, stipulation? Because in Poland, a scandalous situation happened from the legal point of view, namely um, over a year ago, uh, presidential elections in Poland did not happen. The Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland made a decision or took certain decisions regarding the organization of presidential elections in the form of, uh, in the correspondence form. There was no legal basis for that. And on the basis of the decision by the Prime Minister, Polish Post Office collected uh, electoral data from the units of local government. Why am I mentioning this in this specific context? Because what was missing was a decisive 
reaction by the president of the Office for the Protection of uh, Sensitive Information, just as if that institution was not in existence, as if it was not taking care of um, the uh, the um, data of uh, Polish citizens. So this is a signal that shows us that even though the Charter is, uh, is providing for such a strong signal of independence, and yet uh, the functioning of the president in charge of the office responsible for data protection is not fully independent. And I'm talking about it because there are some new EU regulations planned, like digital services package, focusing on digital services. And once again, there are new institutions envisioned to be created by the European Union has to be very vigilant here when checking if these institutions are in fact going to be independent, because if they are uh, controlled, in fact, by the government, that means that they are not fully playing their proper role, their intended role. And another topic that is intertwined uh, and it's also associated with the uh, independence of supervisory offices. I'm uh, talking about the president of the Office for Competency uh, for Competition and the Protection of the Consumer. There is a case now uh, about the takeover of uh, Polska Press by Orlen. And here the president of the office in charge uh, of the protection of consumers has no access to files. He's not reacting uh, to um, the fact that the ruling of the court stopping that transaction is not being observed. I uh, spoke to, uh, I, wrote, I uh, wrote what was written in Politico uh, about the guarantees under Articles 139 and 140 of the Charter. I'm talking about the electoral um, rights in the context of the freedom of speech. The European Union, in my view, has to be very careful when um, looking at Polish right to free election elections, uh, um, uh, free elections to the European Parliament and local uh, elections. Um, so these are the types of elections that are associated with the EU competencies, uh, since our media is so much under the control of the ruling party and the um, central government unit. Um, uh, so uh, should it be outside of the scope for the European Union or, or, or not? Uh, uh, to me, the, mm, uh, all the mm, slap cases that uh, I support uh, are not really directly addressing the problem. I think the most important documents, one of the most important documents last year that is evaluating the situation in Poland is the uh, 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 document evaluating Polish elections stating that these were not fully fair because of the involvement of the public broadcaster. So how are we uh, to expect that during the local elections, for instance, that are to happen in, 20, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2022, how are we to expect that the, these elections are going to be fully independent and fair uh, if the media landscape in Poland is as it is? So this should be uh, the top that is, to me, uh, associated with the uh, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. So these are strong words, uh, some recommendations on your part, in fact. So the final question now to Kamila gasiuk pihovic what would you recommend the European Union, since we are a member state? Um, Fortunately, we uh, have to observe uh, EU uh, laws. So. From your perspective, as a person who's working for the Polish Parliament, what would you recommend in the context of the Charter? Well, uh, responding to this question and taking the opportunity that our debate was listened to by Madam Commissioner, I would like to well, formulate a sort of an appeal or a recommendation perhaps to the European Commission as a whole and the European Union as a whole to take an uh, uncompromising action to defend the rule of law, uh, citizens' rights and human rights in Poland. We do need restoration of the independence uh, of the National Chamber of the Judiciary. We do need the swearing in of three properly selected uh, judges of the um, Constitutional Court. We need for the persecution of judges to stop persecution of all citizens who are involved uh, in the fight for independent judiciary. So the basic infringements of uh, the rule of law uh, 
co conducted by the, the ruling party, they will not be reversed if the European Union does not take action, if it does not uh, um, act uh, and restoration of the rule of law, I think is within our grasp. Us Polish people, the citizens of the European Union, we have no other way of defending ourselves against the infringement, uh, the violation of, the, um, of human rights, other than referring to the European Union. So the European Union has the only effective instrument that can protect us against further going toward the Putin-style dictatorship, uh, and um, that can protect us against the, uh, against the rebirth of totalitarian oppression because in the Central and Eastern Europe, we've had this political sort of tomb and we have buried it. But uh, no, the only way to protect it, to stay uh, this way uh, is uh, the rule of law. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, the European Union, the, the European Court of Justice, the mechanism of uh, um, making uh, EU funds dependent on the rule of law is the only thing that the ruling party is afraid of. I think this is obvious for all of us. Uh, here in Poland, uh, I, well, I'm sure that we all want for the European resources, financial resources to flow into Poland, a free democratic Poland. We don't want these finances to support dictatorship. Negotiating with the, the politicians of the ruling party are like negotiating with the, with the communists. You know, they only fear strength. Uh, the EU uh, respects compromise and dialogue, but Kaczynski will only read that as weakness. Uh, uh, sorry, we have to put a full stop here because we are also focusing on the dialogue. So we, we are trying to focus on the specifics. I'm sure in the second round, we will have a chance to refer to what you have been talking about. But now for a moment, a short video for you that is going to tell us a few more words about the Charter. As the fields of science advance, human dignity must remain in the spotlight, safeguarding our physical and mental integrity. The Charter explicitly promotes these values, including protection against human trafficking. The Charter provides a list of entitlements surrounding people's freedoms with distinct definitions for a sound understanding of our fundamental rights, including the right to asylum and the protection of personal data. More explicitly addressing the full spectrum of discrimination, the Charter better promotes equality and diversity regardless of sex, ethnicity, religion or sexual orientation, emphasizing the rights of children and the elderly, as well as requiring the integration of persons with disabilities. The Charter underlines the importance of solidarity and socio-economic rights and principles ranging from safeguarding our family and professional lives to consumer and environmental protection. The Charter brings to light opportunities for participating in and being protected by the EU legal and political system. This includes the right to good administration and the freedom of movement and residence within the EU.
Going beyond the existing European standards and procedural law, the Charter addresses the right to a fair trial in all possible processes, including administrative, tax or asylum procedures. Thank you very much. I think this video uh, shows uh, the broad scope of the Charter, and now I would like to start a slightly different conversation. We will focus more on the citizens and on, and on the academic community. We have invited two experts uh, here. Professor Anna Wyrozumska, head of the Department of European Constitutional Law at the Faculty of Law and Administration at the University of Łódź. Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Tomasz Grosse, uh, he's uh, a lecturer at the Institute of European Politics, Department of Political Sciences and International Studies at the University of Warsaw. He's also a fellow in the Jagiellonian Club and Sobieski Institute. Welcome, Professor. Welcome, everyone. And uh, Alexandra Dulkiewicz, mayor of Gdańsk. Uh, it's a uh, city symbol when it comes to freedom, the birthplace of solidarity. We are approaching the 40th anniversary of these events. Welcome, Madam President. And uh, Miłosz Gapsa, uh, he's a student uh, of law at the Department of European Constitutional Law. So welcome, everyone. Let me start this conversation, if we may. Uh, we will start with the professors, uh, Professor Wyrozumska, Professor Grossa. I would like to hear about uh, what is your opinion about what you have heard so far during our debate, but also an evaluation by a lawyer uh, and a political scientist? What's the meaning of uh, the charter for European institutions and for the law? Right, uh, much has already been said today, and uh, I think many important elements were emphasized. So, of course, the charter is a is a significant guaranteeing document it uh, formulates certain rights certain provisions that can be used against the public authority uh, in the cases where uh, that public authority is interfering with our rights. And undoubtedly, the main assumption of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, namely to make these rights more visible, has been accomplished. And um, uh, Judge Pultorak actually mentioned that the Charter can be invoked against uh, EU institutions and uh, also against uh, member states, uh, against the state, uh, when public authorities or administrative um, authorities um, are um, adopting or using the EU law. I think um, the, the important thing is there is a recent evolution when it comes to the application of the Charter, namely that the Charter can also be uh, invoked against legal persons and natural persons, so individuals. We can uh, invoke it against um, the um, uh, an employer, for instance, who's discriminating against us or not uh, paying us uh, the sort of remuneration that uh, is uh, legally um, uh, owed according to the Charter. So I think the Charter is gaining in importance as time goes by. Uh, still, I agree that um, it's still underutilized. And uh, importantly, uh, well, there was an interesting study conducted by Eurobarometer showing that only half of the respondents uh, in that study uh, heard about the uh, European Charter of Fundamental Rights. So there is a major task ahead of us, uh, ahead of uh, government, uh, ahead of local government and all of us to promote the content of the Charter and to promote uh, potential uses and utilization of the Charter. Yes, let me remind you that this is the element of the new strategy from December last year. So it's not just about effective use, but also raising awareness of the of societies of European member states when it comes to the role of the Charter. And this is why we are having this conference as well. Now over to Professor Grosse. I would like to ask you as a political scientist as and a person who's very well, very familiar with the European institutions, how do you evaluate the use 
use of the Charter or the approach um, of EU institutions to their own operations uh, in view of the Charter? Well, I think much has already been said uh, on the topic. I would rather focus on uh, as an issue that has not been raised as yet when it comes to the Charter. We have to realize that uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights raises a lot of controversy. Uh, so far, um, we, ha we have all heard about the positives and and that's the right way to go the motivations behind the charter were very noble uh, humanitarian in in the nature but the charter is commonly criticized in many member states and also outside of the european union as a result, I think it's uh, good to quote the four basic arguments uh, from various political um, milieu, conservatives predominantly, uh, contesting the Charter uh, from the document that, uh, well, not long ago was perceived as non -contro not controversial at all, um, is now um, making a source of a political conflict that divides and um, goes against uh, the EU integration process. <clears throat> okay. It may actually contribute to disintegration. So the first argument is um, about what uh, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Bodnar uh, said. Formally, Poland was excluded by Protocol 30 from that charter, but as we know, the um, case laws uh, from the European Court of Justice do not take that into consideration, finding that stipulations of the treaty resulting from that treaty cannot be excluded by a protocol. Uh, Whichever way it may be, the first argument is that one of the basic values, European values listed in Article 2, the rule of law, according to the critics, was infringed by the European Court of Justice, which should be um, a guarantee for the rule of law. The second argument is that the humanitarian values listed in the Charter have become an element of political play. They were, um, they are being controlled by left and liberal um, communities, uh, and in the broader co context, they are against the right-wing parties, against Christian values, and well, many politicians, many intellectuals. Uh, in Poland, uh, in Central Eastern Europe and in the West um, uh, claim that this is an example of uh, nihilism, extreme nihilism. So this is nothing warm and fuzzy, but rather something destructive, not just for the European Union, but uh, more globally. So there are some straightforward criticisms being uh, verbalized that that sort of culture has no right to survive interpreting the, the Charter the way we do. So there are other arguments linked here as well, saying that the, um, that the ideology uh, of European values focusing on uh, retracting from Christian values, at, at the very beginning they were very important in the European context, now they are being sort of pushed out or replaced by more left-wing values, all that means that um, the de democratic standards uh, are being put in question because uh, many people are being excluded from discourse. Uh, competencies of member states are not being respected because the Charter is in fact an instrument for European institutions, um, European Court of Justice first and foremost, allowing it to um, use the competencies that were not envisioned for them in the treaties. Uh, the classical example would be resolutions of the European Parliament focusing on abortion uh, and uh, treating abortion as a right 
of women while the right-wing parties uh, claim that this is nothing more than killing babies. Point number three is that the Charter and the values that go along with it in the liberal and left-wing interpretation mean that the European project uh, is too much focused on ideology, which means that crises and problems cannot be solved. And again, migration crisis is here put as an example, which is unsolvable, among others, because Europe uh, cannot close its borders against uh, illegal migrants, um, calling upon uh, migrants, uh, the rights of the migrants, uh, basing on the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. And uh, so these rights are in fact blocking the possibility of solving that crisis. And uh, um, many Europeans, uh, as research shows, many Europeans demand that that crisis be solved. So this is a classical example. And another argument uh, of um, extreme right-wing parties, when universal rights uh, are being more highly valued than the rights of the EU citizens. As a result, these citizens may feel discouraged uh, when it comes to integration. And the fourth argument, uh, the most important, I think, in our discussion, today because um, here the issue of values, uh, European values comes to the forefront. Uh, these values uh, definitely have their role to play in the conflict uh, between European institutions and the Polish government. I'm talking about uh, the rule of law, but in the broader context, European values. And this is being treated as a sort of um, well, another manifestation of a political asymmetry between Western and Central Europe. That asymmetry is based on certain political dependency and disciplining the, uh, uh, the, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe that are rebelling, for instance, against migration policy. And that is being done by European institutions or, in fact, by um, by the most influential Western countries influencing these institutions. So now summarizing these four points, of course, we can present other arguments like the ones that we um, uh, were presented uh, during the first part of our discussion, the arguments in favor of the Charter, presenting it as a um, as a success of European integration. And uh, this view is substantiated, in my view at least. But we also have to be aware that this Charter and more broadly European values as such are being met with uh, a lot of negativity on various levels. It's not about individual politicians of the Polish or Hungarian government. I'm talking about a major part uh, of voters and the more um, uh, intense this conflict is becoming, uh, we have heard some calls uh, upon European institutions to be non-compromising in this fight. The worse it's going to be for European integration because uh, uh, we are not going to put this conflict to rest uh, uh, using these methods. I think we should restore some sort of uh, subsidiary character of approaching values within the framework of the certain competencies of member states and within uh, the competencies of national democracies. Let them, using elections, define what's the scope of abortion or, or, or other rights, uh, uh, because if we uh, um, overextend European institutions and try to force um, certain changes that uh, I think, you know, with a lot of effort, it can be counterproductive for the process of European integration. Thank you for this voice. You have mentioned that the broader the context of the Charter, the more 
uh, controversies there are and the stronger the political opposition but you know uh, local government is closest to uh, to the voters so i would like to ask your opinion about the meaning of the charter and when you when you're talking to the citizens of your town to the townspeople from gdansk uh, do you feel that they are aware of the charter and how do people perceive the potential that is associated with the charter ladies and gentlemen i wouldn't like to quash your hope but i think uh, in when it comes to general awareness we, we, we never did a study in gdansk when it comes to their uh, the awareness of our inhabitants as regards the existence of the charter of fundamental rights but i don't think uh, well, well, there was a study quoted by Professor Verozumska, and I would say that the average uh, would be similar to um, to the number that we see for uh, European Union. Perhaps in Poland, that number would even be lower than that. So, I think the question should be posed differently. I listened to what Professor Grosser uh, said in a uh, said a moment ago. I think the fact is that without education, and I'm talking about the lowest level here, but also ongoing education, lifelong education that would focus on fundamental rights. I'm not, I'm not just talking about the charter here, but I'm talking about fundamental rights that are a product of certain community of values. Without that, it's going to be extremely difficult not only to build uh, the Republic of Poland that is based on democracy and values, but the same goes for the European Union as a whole. On behalf of uh, Polish local government, uh, I am a representative to the uh, European Committee of the Regions, and I'm a reporter for a document that was mentioned at the very beginning by um, Vice President Jourova, European Democracy Action Plan, that clearly shows, and to be, to be honest, I would like to combine these two things, the charter and Mm, the threats that uh, the threats to democracy that we are facing currently not only in poland but uh, elsewhere in europe as well and uh, from the conversations that i've had uh, my meetings with the representatives of uh, fundamental rights agency it would seem that without education step by step education we will not cope i am sure that it's not just about you know because when you think feel feel you know you think about education you you think about children in schools and you know somewhere in elementary school uh, during civics classes we we try to teach them about the values that uh, uh, govern our society. I'm talking about lifelong education, and this is a challenge, a challenge that is being faced not only by local authorities. I am very happy to be invited here, uh, but I want to emphasize that this is also a huge work for NGOs, because those who uh, enjoy public trust um, Local government definitely enjoys that trust, but without partnership with the other organizations, organizations that are separate from public authority, because, you know, local government is still part of public authority. So without NGOs, we cannot convince citizens that they do have their rights and they should enjoy these rights. Let me just mention, because the director uh, of Flaherty mentioned uh, Mayor Adamovich, and I would like to remind you that Gdańsk is, was awarded uh, uh, an award uh, 
for one of its uh, its projects uh, focusing on migrants, uh, integrating migrants in the Tri-City area. Congratulations on the project and congratulations uh, uh, on the win in the Pan-European competition. So this is an example of how local government is uh, able to educate uh, adults um, and uh, how, how can local government uh, employ the spirit of the law in practice. But I would like to also uh, ask uh, uh, Miwash as a student, because you're a student of law. So I am. I would be very curious to hear about uh, how you are being treated, uh, sorry, uh, taught about uh, the Charter. Uh, do you consider it practically possible to be employed? Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Of course, I can only speak as a representative of students. I am not a lawyer yet. I am not as experienced as all other participants of this meeting. It may seem surprising, but I would risk a statement that uh, young students of the law don't really know much about the charter uh, at my university other than uh, uh, the course that we uh, have conducted by Professor Verozumska that focuses on the European Union law, uh, other courses do not really mention much of the EU law. Uh, so uh, the, um, the EU law is not very broadly mentioned, lectured on to the students. When it comes to the charter itself, it's not really taught about at all. Uh, only during that course about the EU uh, law uh, can we hear about it. To what extent young people like yourself um, know about the existence of fundamental rights and the fact that you can fight for these rights? I think young lawyers like myself, they uh, when they think about human rights, they rather think about the convention, the UN Convention on Human Rights. And I think this is a problem because um, I had a chance to take part in a, um, in a seminar at my university where we talked about uh, uh, Charter of uh, Human Rights, about the horizontal administration and application of uh, the Charter. But if uh, I think if the young lawyer is not interested in EU law, they wouldn't really find out much about the Charter because sometimes even uh, during the course on EU law, uh, the, that's only a single semester, so there isn't much time to discuss these issues. I think uh, this is too little time to really become familiar uh, with um, with uh, these with, with the charter and this is concerning to me because I think many of my colleagues are going to become counselors um, legal advisors and uh, they uh, could uh, invoke specific stipulations of the charter before the judge but first to do that they have to be aware of its existence thank you uh, and now over to professor verozumska uh, and coming back to professor grossa in a moment how can we increase uh, the level of awareness among young people not just lawyers but political scientists um, about uh, perhaps not the details of the charter but some opportunities that it creates to all citizens if I may first refer to Professor Grosse uh, said, could I? Would that be okay? Uh, yes, please go ahead. So maybe let me start with that because uh, uh, th this is exactly what uh, we just said. We need uh, education, basic education about uh, the Charter, about the UN Convention on Human Rights. Um, what Professor Grosse said sort of it, it means that one of the elements um, contributing to the weakness uh, of the charter is that in some countries including Poland we don't have proper legal basis for the uh, application of the charter and uh, the fact is that the famous uh, the protocol number 30 that is binding Poland definitely weakens the charter in Poland, uh, um, but um, 
let me tell you this this is completely not true that the effect of protocol 30 is uh, that uh, the charter is not binding for poland it's enough to read the preamble to uh, the protocol 30 which clearly states that the aim of that protocol is to clarify the application of the charter uh, as it uh, refers to poland and the uk which is in in itself uh, is an indicator that the charter is meant to bind both poland and the uk the, mm, the court of justice actually uh, clarified that it was there was a case focusing on the uk that was in 2011 so the motives from the preamble were raised uh, here and it was clearly stated that uh, both poland and the uk are not in any way exempted from the use of charter even the polish uh, constitution court claimed that since the charter was announced uh, in the official journal it is binding in poland so there are there are no doubts here there are no nothing requires clarification here the protocol in itself was uh, re written using the type of wording that is very difficult very complex and the court of justice uh, clarified the meaning of article one uh, of that protocol stating that that stipulation is not really bringing anything new to to the topic it's just confirming uh, what is uh, written in the charter itself namely that the charter is not in any way changing the competences of the european union so this is uh, very clearly stated in article one of the protocol the same goes for article two it's also not uh, adding anything new it's just confirming the fact that if any stipulations of the charter refer to national law or the eu law they are to be um, used in line or in compliance with the uh, national law or eu law and this leads us to abortion because the eu has no competences when it comes to abortion whether it's allowed or not has to be uh, uh, stipulated by the national law so uh, the, the same goes for marriage uh, whether it's uh, only um, uh, between a man and woman or the charter clearly states in article 9 that this is left to the competencies of the member state professor grossa said that eu institutions do not respect competencies of member states because the european parliament uh, issued a resolution regarding abortion it's not necessarily completely true because the european parliament has supervisory authority and it can speak up on a number of issues including uh, such like this one this is not legally binding that resolution is not legally binding it can just uh, draw our attention to certain issues it can be a sort of a reason for discussion but this is no interference uh, into the competencies of the member state and now if somebody says that the uh, fundamental uh, rights char charter goes against christian values well a number of stipulations in the charter <clears throat> reflects what's in the un convention on human rights so we might as well say that the un convention of human rights is not based on christian values and i have to say i am surprised to hear something like that because the right to privacy freedom of religion um, th these are uh, all christian values and uh, i do not understand why uh, this is the perception of uh, the european charter of, of fundamental rights i do agree that in some cases where the European Court of Justice is deciding on where uh, the charter borders with the state law, there might be some conflict, some tension uh, here. And this is happening recently. This has been re happening recently uh, when it comes to Poland and uh, the rule of law um, the, this is the manifestation of the borders of article 47 but i have to say that it's not just the court of justice that says that one of the key elements you know, of the uh, system of legal protection is for our cases to be tried by an independent judge uh, this was also confirmed by the 
uh, European uh, Court of Human Rights. So this is, uh, from the logical point of view, something that should not raise any uh, questions. Professor, since unfortunately we have to draw to a close very slowly, just one, just one more thing, if I might add. I don't like bringing together or lumping together migration problem with uh, what uh, the um, uh, European uh, uh, Court of Justice is doing. Um, uh, this is not about the, you know punishing peop uh, Poland for not letting migrants in. I think it's a misunderstanding and uh, uh, it's a completely different thing what uh, Professor Grosser said. When uh, uh, fundamental rights can be curbed uh, for the safety of the country or the EU, whether we open borders or not. Let me just remind you that on Thursday, we're going to have another conference. Um, I will be moderating it as well, and it will be fully focused on migrations. So if you are interested, Thursday, uh, Thursday at um, 2 p.m., uh, Commissioner Johansson is going to be with us. And now over to Professor Grosse and uh, Madame Tulkiewicz. Thank you very much for these very interesting voices, especially from Madam Professor, but all the others as well. As an introduction, let me say this. I was just trying to show you a broader landscape of uh, political discussion that is now happening and surrounding the rule of law, uh, the European values, including the Charter of Fundamental uh, Rights. Of course, we are all entitled to our own opinion whether uh, these reservations or criticism by uh, the right-wing parties in Poland, in Hungary, but also in France, in Italy, uh, whether they hold true or not. So uh, we, are, we are not talking about some, you know, intellectuals who could be considered um, uh, insignificant. We are talking about university professors who um, take any, play an important role in the public debate in their respective countries. We can have different opinions, but we have to remember that we don't have a single opinion, single one opinion that would um, be agreed to by the European Commission. So we are talking about two separate worlds here. The um, political pol polarizing that's been um, happening or deepening within the European Union as regards European values, especially in Poland, but not only in Poland, uh, it all started around the topic of migrations, in fact, and it all started around migrations in Western Europe. So that whole division uh, and how dynamic this discussion is, I think all this is harmful for European integration. So I think we should consider uh, how to solve the situation, change it in order to preserve the value of European integration. Uh, issue number two, and here I would like to agree with Madam Professor. Yes, in fact, all these arguments saying that the Charter is uh, not included in the legal order, they are all um, false. Nonetheless, it's good to remember them. It's like, uh, well, what, what Madam Professor said, Article 1 of the Charter very clearly stipulates that we cannot, on the basis of the Charter, uh, go before Polish or European courts and uh, criticize the, op the actions, the operations of Polish or British administration. That article was, in fact, uh, violated by the uh, Court of Justice, because many times in its rulings, even those focusing on the rule of law in Poland, uh, refers to the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. The third thing that I wanted to say is that the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, and here I agree with uh, 
Professor Verozumska, it includes a number of uh, stipulations that could be used by right wing groups, like, for instance, those that support the right to life, because in Article 2, we hear the right to life. But it's like with the treaties, you've got certain provisions mentioning certain issues, like, for, for instance, respect for cultural identity of member states or not infringing uh, on their competencies. Uh, I'm talking about the proportionality and subsidiarity principle. But in other articles, you read about uh, the safeguarding of uh, uh, judiciary independence. So there are various articles, and within this discussion, both legal and political, different articles are, be, be, are being pointed out. And the same goes for the Charter. Article 2 can be used by certain groups that fight for protection of life, but there are other articles that are completely uh, disliked by these same groups, like respect for cultural diversity, rights of migrants. There is finally, um, under the article on non-discrimination, there is a mention for respect of sexual orientation, and that is being treated more broadly than just two genders. So this generates a lot of protest on the part of uh, some groups against the Charter. And now considering the political temperature in Europe, when it comes to the discussions regarding values and the rule of law, the Charter is now becoming, for both sides of that conflict, is becoming a sort of a stick to hit your opponent with. But is that contributing to the uh, authority of the Charter, the authority of EU institutions? I doubt that. Thank you for this voice in the discussion. I think it is important because I'm sure that nobody is served well if law is politicized. Finally, well, this is going to be the last intervention in this discussion. I would like to ask um, Mayor Dulkevich, you're a politician, you're a mayor, you won elections for the mayor of Gdańsk. I would like to ask you, do you see any possibility of uh, bringing together that political conflict um, uh, with what the local government is doing, basically solving problems of regular people on the local scale? It's a difficult question, but I think it's all about uh, clear intentions. I am lucky enough uh, to be a graduate of law. And I remember that the preamble to various legal acts is a significant part of that legal act. So when I was getting ready for this discussion, I actually had a look at the preamble to the Charter, and I would like to quote one single sentence, if I may. The union is built on indivisible rights, uh, uh, dignity, equality, solidarity. It's being based on the rules of democracy and the rule of law. So I think if this is how we understand, if this is uh, uh, how we uh, look at the rights uh, enshrined in the Charter, uh, it's going to be easier for us to interpret them. Just one more sentence to comment. I also feel a member uh, of the uh, Christian community. I am uh, the uh, member uh, um, of the uh, European People's Party. And uh, uh, I think that the conversation about the right to life uh, it should not be the main topic. Democracy, freedom uh, are important. Uh, rule of law in the case of Poland are very important because these are one of the key values, like we read in the Charter, the, the state based on the rule of law. Uh, uh, so uh, these are essential issues. And now uh, over to the local community. Uh, I will keep coming back to education and learning or teaching by example, showing in specific situations what it means uh, to preserve human dignity, 
um, you mentioned the award that our city was granted back in 2018 because we can, of course, talk about migrants, um, refugees, uh, talk, uh, showing horrible things that happened somewhere elsewhere. They are not necessarily always fully true, but we can also talk about migrants or refugees. When you look at a, an, uh, at a lady who's selling bread to us every day uh, in a shop and her daughter is going to the same school as my daughter. So these are very specific things uh, that today lie in the hands of mayors. Um, uh, so integrating people who came to our country for a variety of, of, of reasons. So integrating them with the community. If we remember the values, the elementary values uh, of dignity of every human being, which is central to Christianity as well, it's going to be easier for us to solve everyday problems. Thank you very much for this very reasonable voice. If we don't know what to do, use, let's use common sense. Uh, it's been 20 years of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. We also have a new strategy from December last year, uh, focusing on making this uh, charter more important for all of us. So reinforcing uh, civic society, uh, road sign for EU institutions and um, raising awareness of all of us, uh, members of the society. I hope we succeeded in doing just that today. Thank you very much to all our viewers. Um, thank you to all of you who listened to us um, uh, on Facebook.